All right. Um, so maybe we'll start. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the April Narrative Medicine Rounds. I'm Maura Spiegel, and I'm a, a part of the Narrative Medicine faculty. Um, for those of you who are joining for the first time, a couple of words about narrative medicine. Um, these rounds are hosted by the Division of Narrative Medicine in the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. The Division of Narrative Medicine fortifies clinical practice by training practitioners to recognize, interpret, and glean insights relevant to patient care and clinician performance from the study of humanities, the arts, and creative work. Our aim is person-centered, respectful healthcare, clinical attunement, collaborative skills, and creative capacities. Um, before I introduce Jace, I, I've, I've been asked to mention a few basic Zoom ground rules to ensure that the program grows smoothly. So we ask that you please keep your microphone muted to cut down on background noise during the program. Um, we are going to lock the meeting in a few minutes for security reasons. If you leave the meeting or your connection is broken, um, you may not be able to re-enter last. Um, in the unlikely event that there is a Zoom intrusion, we will terminate the event right away, but send you a link as soon as we can to um, rejoin. Uh, during the talk, we're going to ask you to think of questions you'd like to ask of Jace, um, and we will get to your questions um, you know, a little later in the evening. Jace is going to talk to us a bit about his work, and, um, and then I'm going to ask him some questions, and then we'd love to hear your questions. Um, we ask you to put your questions into the chat, and um, and uh, we won't be monitoring it until we get to the questions. So maybe wait to put your questions till that um, till that moment comes in the in the evening. Um, at the end, um, a, there'll be a link to um, to give you more information about the Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics and the program in narrative medicine. Now it's my really fantastic pleasure. <laughs> to introduce writer, producer, and narrative medicine alumnus, Jace Miles Paris. Jace is currently a writer for Grey's Anatomy, the award-winning and record-breaking medical drama now in its 17th season. Before landing this gig, Jace worked on both major studio and independent films, including as an executive producer of the 2016 web series, We've Been Around, an anthology of short films about transgender pioneers released by Focus Features. I want to back up a little bit because, um, because I know Jace for a long time. So in 2008, um, Jace took a detour from film to join the inaugural class of Columbia's graduate program in narrative medicine, the very first class. And today, fishing around in my computer, I found a note I'd written as I was reviewing the written materials of his application. This was our very first class, our very first admissions pool, and it's about 13 years ago. What I jotted down was he has great spirit, inspiring spirit, seems to get something fundamental about our work and the possibility of doing something with integrity that is helpful and creative. And then I noted, let's interview and see just how much of a handful he is. And he, and he is a handful. Um, fishing around, I also found um, Jace's write-up of um, his witnessing experience, which is part of our program and in the first year. And um, sitting in Dr. Cunningham's pediatric clinic, um, Jace wrote this amazing report. I'm just going to read one tiny fragment from it. So there's a pediatric clinic. Her chin is shiny with drool. She does have little star earring studs in her ears. She's flailing about in that fat suit, clumsy, herky-jerky baby way. She grips the exam table, paper, it crinkles under her. She's a fatty. None of them like the tongue depressor. She laughs, we will never know why. It's just a fragment of this beautiful thing he wrote. His thinking has sparkle and charm and depth. I recall a gorgeous essay he wrote that year on a story by Henry James. And he has always had a serious interest in the creative process and in the logistical process of making films, um, which he'll talk about this evening. 
While pursuing his work in film, Jace went on to teach medical humanities at CUNY School of Medicine and in our narrative medicine program here at Columbia, and I got to teach a class with him. His assignments were ingenious, unexpected, and just lit things up. So now Jace is an important part of the creative team of a beloved television series. I'm a fan. This past year, fil filming under wildly challenging circumstances, the show took on the present moment, really took it on. Grey's Anatomy has always been topical, but this was different. This was TV drama somehow from the front lines. I've never seen anything quite like it. Watching a beautifully written show in which medical providers were <clears throat> struggling, flailing, and persisting in the midst of the worst, and I hope it was the worst, of the pandemic in our country, gave the audience something <clears throat> remarkable. It gave voice to what we also craved, a powerful and beautiful dramatic expression of loss, fear, rage, and exhaustion. The program, Jace, you delivered one wonderful form of narrative medication. So please take it away. Oh gosh, Maura, thank you so much for that introduction. That was uh, surprising to hear that um, and just so great. Um, and I just wanna say uh, before I read this that uh, when I uh, first got this invitation, um, I uh, sort of turned it down because I didn't really uh, think I uh, maybe anyone would have anything to ask or anything to say and talking to Maura, she suggested, well, maybe it's because you don't know what you have to say. Um, and that was a, uh, that wound up being very wise as Maura usually is. Uh, so I'm gonna, I wrote a little something uh, to sort of maybe on-ramp us into uh, this discussion um, that I'm gonna start reading now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope wherever you are, you're staying safe and sane and inspired, and that we and our Wi-Fi connections are all in excellent health. <clears throat> uh, first, I'd like to thank the Narrative Medicine Department for inviting me today. It's no exaggeration to say that Narrative Medicine and my association with Columbia's Narrative Medicine Department and Graduate Program beginning in 2008 and continuing to this moment has been one of the more rewarding and lucky encounters of my adult life. I've been attending rounds as an audience member for well over a decade, and it's never stopped being a source of inspiration. So many nights leaving the faculty club full of sparkles and large thoughts, not wanting to fold that largeness into the subterranean confines of the subway, and therefore walking the 70 blocks downtown all the way home, lit up by the implications and challenges of a new idea. Being part of that tradition, even as a clump of pixels transmitted to private screens instead of in person with the cheese plate and pasta salad and plastic cups is truly an honor and thrill. And no matter how this goes, it's nice to have an excuse to dress up a little. For context, I bought this blazer in April of 2019 and just cut the tags off this morning. It's a true story. Um, as I understand it, there might be uh, quite a few questions and I want to answer as many as possible with as much consideration and time for tangents and nuance and stuff as possible. So I'll try to keep this opening a bit brief. Uh, however, in my limited experience, writing for Grey's Anatomy is a bit like telling someone you have a pet giraffe. They want to know what having a giraffe is like, but they also want to know how the hell you got that giraffe in the first place. So some, autobiograph uh, some autobiography is probably in order for anyone here who doesn't know me personally. Uh, the short version is that I completed my undergraduate education certain that I wanted to be a screenwriter in the then thriving feature film industry. But after a year or so of doing film work, mostly in publicity and as an assistant, I was sure that film, maybe show business as a whole, was not for me. About this period, I'll just say that I've come to believe luck plays an underrated role in one starting out in any field. And I don't mean the luck of being involved in good projects. Uh, rather, I mean the luck of meeting good mentors, people who model for you a way of having the passions you have and also surviving and living well in the world. In that respect, I did not have good luck starting out and uh, had to sit my parents down and devastate them with the very difficult news that I was gonna have to go with my fallback of being a doctor. 
knowing little about medicine and still wanting to find some binding tissue between it and my, uh, let's say, liberal artsy disposition, and also living a 15 minute walk from 116th Street led me to Columbia and a Master of Science program that was slated to begin in the fall in a field called narrative medicine. Spoiler, my enrollment in the program did not lead to my going to medical school, but it did lead to my teaching at Columbia and CUNY School of Medicine, which thoroughly, indescribably lit me up um, and with part-time dabbles in long form ghost writing and on film projects that though modest were enormously satisfying for the people I met and the things I got to do and stories they produced. This was all deeply satisfying. And then one Sunday, a friend who's a television director called and told me his friend, Krista Vernoff is the showrunner for Grey's Anatomy and they're looking for a new writer. And he recommended me. And do I have a writing sample I can send in the next, oh, two hours. That's another story, but suffice it to say, the update on my decision that screenwriting and show business was absolutely not for me is that I now work for a Walt Disney owned network writing for the longest running medical drama in history. With that streak of wrongness in mind, maybe it should not have been surprising upon arriving at Grey's Anatomy and the world of making the show, the writer's room, the set, production, and air, upon joining the fantastic ensemble, ensemble of creatives and craftspeople the show employs and draws from, upon stepping into the long history and lore of Seattle Grace and Grace Loan Memorial Hospital, maybe it should not have been surprising to find myself proven wrong yet again, proven wrong repeatedly, proven wrong daily. But two years deep, uh, my apparent strengths as a writer here are not at all what I expected at the start. Moreover, I can unambiguously say that joining the writing staff of Grey's Anatomy has expanded my concept of what writing is, how stories work, how commercial art works, and the plasticity of my own process. More on all of that in due course, I'm sure. In short, writing for television is a weird job as carny as corporate gets, or maybe as corporate as carny gets, but lucid and madcap in equal measure, necessarily intimate and strangely impersonal. The writer's room is often functioning as the tendon that connects the artistic and fiscal demands of telling a story seen by millions, aspiring to satisfy and delight, to confront and to conform and to comfort, uh, to move viewers to laughter and grief and catharsis, and also somehow sell laundry detergent and fried chicken sandwiches. The inherent zaniness of a story, a film story with cameras and lights and actors and costumes and fake blood and tears and written lines standing as the central pillar in this endeavor means there will always be a little topsy-turvy in it. It will always be a little nuts. And in that respect, I suppose the job tends therapeutically and I think rather beautifully to reflect the tonal seesaw of real life. Everything is just a small tweak away from being sad or hilarious. And no matter how somber the day's work, every day is also, as James L. Brooks puts it, a little song, a little dance, a little seltzer down your pants. And he made terms of endearment. I should probably warn you that in two years, I haven't actually spoken much about being a TV writer and never in public before today. I spent the first year, as is common, this is a very common story with TV writers, so uncertain of what my job was, when or if I was doing well or badly, and so convinced that I would any day be politely let go, that it was a shock last March to find the season winding down and myself still here. Then COVID hit and swept the show and whirled along with it. The past year, personally and professionally, and indeed in the lives of Meredith Bailey Weber and the rest of the characters of Grey's Anatomy has very much been the story of that. COVID has been an event of profound disruption, heroism, frustration, death and grief, reaching outward and looking inward, fear, reunion, rejection, redemption, on and on, we all know. We all went through it, we're all still going through it. We'll spend years collectively reckoning with what we've witnessed together. I was the first writer to return to the office when we started pre-production this season. And the feeling was eerie of stepping back in time to a moment that had been interrupted. There were still glasses of water on desks, copies of obsolete script pages in the printer, takeout menus, sitting out for restaurants that had in the interim permanently closed. Yes, there's been so much surviving and checking in on our nearest and dearest over the past 13-ish months that how much do the writers have to know the medicine to write an episode? Or is the surgical equipment real? Or how much of the plot do you know before of the season before starting to write? 
That stuff hasn't really come up much, but when it has, I found myself caught unintentionally rambling, um, maybe seeming to contradict myself, maybe actually contradicting myself as I likely will today, because the truth is contradictory and the truth in this job is in its own way customizable. That is to say that making the show is a massive endeavor and the objective is to be helpful. And that objective is complicated by the fact that when you're new, you don't quite know what helpful is and you quickly learn the most unhelpful thing you can do is linger and lurk, asking, how was that? Was that good? Did I help? Was that helpful? Even a place as patient and feedback friendly as this show demands a high tolerance for uncertainty and knows for noticing what works without being told and a willingness to create your own rules of thumb that function as self-created on-ramps, merging your working style with the show's traffic at speed. For a new writer, most of this trial and error happens in the writer's room. I'm gonna take a sip of this, hold on. Most of this happens in the writer's room. Right off the bat, I'll say the Grey's Anatomy writer's room is a place populated exclusively with people I adore and admire and trust. It's a place I feel safe and encouraged to be adventurous. It's a place I laugh so much. It's one of the few places where the people who make the show can on occasion feel the magic of the show happening. Those rare indelible moments when you all together share a vision of what it will be like when something works. The writer's room is also a place that is completely goddamn mystifying to this day, but especially when you're starting out. For clarity, the writer's room is literally a room in our case, it's a room of couches and deep chairs that are surrounded by these um, dry erase boards on rollers. And in normal time, it's where the writers gather and construct bit by bit the pieces that will later become the show. I suppose another way of saying that is where we write uh, everything except for actual scenes. And you could also call this outlining or planning or brainstorming or debating or rough drafting. The unions and networks and studios call it writing. And the way this particular version of writing works is by everyone pitching ideas and gradually under the leadership of the showrunner and head writers, those pitches being rejected and selected and explored and crossbred and nurtured. Uh, and eventually expanded into rough beats, which become fleshed out beats, which become outlines, which become the scenes, which become a script, which become the show. I'm really generalizing here and I totally welcome you to ask about this process. I'll let you determine for yourself whether writing out loud in a group fits your definition of writing. Whether it does or not, the transition to this method is pretty much universally jarring for those accustomed, as I imagine most of us here are, to writing alone on the page or screen and in the privacy of one's own head. For me, that shift reached almost pubescent levels of awkwardness. Externalizing your own process is all gangly limbs and dopey growth spurts. You're Bambi sliding on the ice, you're an athlete in their rookie year. All potential and inexperience careening into what works, overthinking every win and loss, building your working model of the way it goes. This is a Higgs boson level mystery for the writers of any show. What is a good pitch? More specifically, what is a good pitch for me? Where exactly is the overlap between what the show needs and what I do well? What do I do well? What the fuck am I supposed to do with this giraffe? When asked what made Downton Abbey, uh, such a well-designed show, I once heard showrunner Julian Fellows describe a moment from his childhood. Apparently as a young boy, Fellows loved to bake. For him, baking was a kind of play and once entirely by accident, he said, he baked a perfect eclair. Over and over, he tried to replicate the eclair, over and over he failed. Downton Abbey, Fellows said, was like that perfect eclair. Its creation and success were a mystery. So maybe the writer's room is a place you sit baking, hoping to make a perfect eclair by accident. You sometimes bake a winner, you mostly bake duds, you close your eyes and trust your taste, you adjust as you go, you come up with best practices, you sense what works and try to codify it. For example, here's a rule that works for me. It turns out that for me in the room, a feeling is not an idea. A feeling is not an idea. For some of you, this might be obvious, but for me, for me outside of the room, feelings and the onset of strong feelings is the alarm bell that it's time to write. 
you go for a walk or you hear a song or someone enrages you or something draws you in or whatever, but you're living your life and a chemical reaction occurs and you know, I know something's there. I need to sit, I need a paper and pen. Give me a second, okay, okay. And you start and there it is. However, given, the evi given new evidence, a more precise and useful definition for me is that feelings are surface evidence that ideas are somewhere underneath. Feelings are an X on the map that you stick your shovel in and the things you muck through and eventually write through to excavate that buried idea now revealed, useful and intact. Or at least that's what it seems like. And in that model, a skeptic might say, I'm being dumb and there's only an illusory difference between a feeling and idea. And the uh, feeling is the pre-idea and the eventual idea is just a feeling that you've hung images and symbols on and all of it is always you. And the acts of stopping and thinking and writing are actually one enormously complicated act of absorbing the raw data of experience in your own way. And yeah, maybe so, but in the room, that's not useful either because all of that is process. All of that is time, your time, your process of getting to the thing, right? And in the room, at least at my level, the thing, the fix, the story, what happens to whom and how does that slot into other things that happen before and after is really all that matters. And the feeling, that first bright, urgent thing telling you, now's the time to say something. Say something, you idiot. Now, 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 trust me, just speak me into existence. It turns out that thing spoken aloud is nonsense. It's useless magma. It's weird. Nothing's organized. Nothing is formed. You raise your hand and you, you burst in and you're thinking, oh, 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 you say, okay, okay, okay. What if, what if Maggie and Winston? So, all right. We start out with Maggie and Winston, right? And I, you know, I think it'd be great if Maggie, like, cause like maybe after a cardiac medical, you know, something, someone's wrong, something's wrong with their, someone's heart. And then maybe Maggie's feeling misunderstood. And then like, I don't know, like in the parking lot or somewhere, something happens where Maggie and Winston talk about something, maybe like that cardiac case that I was saying. And Winston says, I understand you in those words, or I don't know, maybe not. But then he has to go and he leaves and we're off Maggie and she does something that lets us know she feels understood. What about that? And you're so embarrassed and you feel so, so misled by your feelings because it turns out the filter through which I turn my life into writing doesn't work in reverse or in collaboration with a team of other writers out loud on the spot. And what does work for me the pitches that do connect and have a chance to survive intact, the way those pitches make themselves known. I guess that's also a feeling, but it's a different kind of feeling. The feeling for me that says it's time to talk in the room is the pop of pleasure you get when you've solved a problem. It's, it's visual and it's spatial and it's Tetris-like and it's a feeling of comfort and closure. It's that thing like, oh, if I just take the 123 to 14th Street and walk a block west to 8th Avenue, I'll save the time I spend transferring to the AC at Columbus Circle. Or, oh, if the patient works for DoorDash instead of in finance, you can explain the food and the car and the cell phone in a way that makes her sympathetic and not irresponsible. Or, oh, what if Bailey and Owen get stuck together in the elevator? That way they can both be late and we get the scene between them where they talk about having dreams and missing your moment. Or, oh, if the dialogue in the MRI scene happened in the breezeway when the ambulance arrives, they can be rushing and organically have to cut their conversation short instead of Levi cutting their conversation short because he's not even there anymore because we moved him on to that Amelia story. It's as close as writing gets to being chiropractic. When it's good, you can almost hear the story crack into alignment. Two years ago, I would have said good writing is about problems that can't be solved. Fixes schmixes. Good writing starts with, a feel, with feeling troubled. You start with a conundrum, something that makes you furious and futility, and you approach something immense and impossible, and you charge straight at it with your little sword, and you let it squish you, and your talent comes popping out of your skull as you die, and that splat of heroic defeat is the whatever essay. These days, to that I re I'd respond, well, that sounds a bit intense, but whatever works for you. So one could say the writer's room is a place where I, where I try not to write, because in there, not writing is how I write best. In one of my favorite pieces I encountered as a student in the narrative medicine graduate program, the philosopher 
I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Gaston Bachelard, uses the concept of nests, literally nests as in the things bird make, birds make, as a jumping off point for a consideration, I would argue, of the deep courage required for productive, proactive optimism. Bachelard writes, when we examine a nest, we place ourselves at the origin of confidence in the world. We receive a beginning of confidence and urge toward cosmic confidence. Would a bird build its nest if it did not have its instinct for confidence in the world? If we heed this call and make an absolute refuge of such a precarious shelter as a nest, our house apprehended in its dream potentiality becomes a nest in the world. From my incredibly lucky position in the nest of this show, I just in closing wanna say how moving it's been over the past year to see the narrative medicine department enlarge and build its own nest outward, always outward, larger, more, 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 at a time when the world does not appear to inspire much confidence. I hope I can be a small part of that warmth generating collective and that someone here gets some value out of something I have to offer. One of the things I like most about this field is the variety of interest and talents and ambitions it attracts and the constant surprise to be found in what folks are up to and what they wanna know more about. So feel free to ask me anything and I'll do my best to make an eclair by accident. Um, and with that, let's get to it. Oh gosh, my, my face hurts from smiling. Thank you so much, 